Good afternoon, everyone. Can we get the uh, music down there so we can get the next speaker up? Wonderful. So I understand this last session in this room was uh, quite great, quite wonderful, which is, which is dynamite. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce uh, to you Hugh Williams. Um, I, I don't know what to say about him other than uh, there are times that I just want to hug the guy because he's just infectious with energy and that's just dynamite. And at other times I want to talk to you about him for the next three hours, but then that would take away from listening to him. Um, he, a GBS patient, um, he happens to be the vice president at Google for Google Maps. I'm sure you have all used Google Maps and that's his baby. Um, he is um, energetic, enthusiastic, a great patient, a great friend of the foundation. He's gonna talk about his uh, runs to raise awareness and to raise funds. And uh, while you're eating, um, just try to uh, give him as much attention as you can and listen to what he's got to say. It's very inspiring. I, I could not be happier to have him here. Uh, with all of us. So uh, to my right is Hugh Williams, and would you just welcome with a round of applause, please. That was, um, that was an incredibly kind introduction. Um, so as Santo said, my name's Hugh Williams. Um, yeah, I do work at Google, and I do run Google Maps. That's, my, that's my, kind of my day job. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal story um, today and just share with you uh, the story of last year. Um, but first, um, so I'm, uh, I'm originally from Alabama, as you can tell by my accent. Um, so yeah, in all seriousness, I grew up in Australia. Uh, I moved to uh, the United States in uh, around 2004. And I'm a tech guy. I uh, spent, spent a good part of my career at Microsoft, uh, at eBay, and a couple other places, some good stories in there, and, uh, and now I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to be at Google. Um, I had GBS in 2009, so right in the middle of this, uh, of this whole sort of you know, professional story. Um, I'd actually just landed my first real ever executive gig, um, and GBS kind of hit, which was, uh, which was quite something. I feel very, very blessed, though, that you know, I had a relatively mild case of GBS. I certainly didn't end up on a respirator. Um, but, you know, it was nonetheless something that, uh, you know, really, really shook me um, and completely changed my priorities. And I'm sure most of you have been through that experience as well. Uh, so, you know, I think if you'd asked me pre-2009 what my priorities were, I probably would have faked something about family, but what I probably would have really meant was work. Uh, I'd say post-2009, um, for me, uh, you know, I re deeply realized that health is the most important thing in the world. Um, you know, without your health, you can't look after your family. Uh, without your health, you, you can't, you know, contribute in a professional capacity. And so, you know, I'm well aware that health is the most important thing, and, and I know that I'm very much preaching to the, the converted with that message. I'm also very clear in my head today that, you know, family is the second most important thing, and then comes work. And all three of those things are, you know, are still uh, very, very important to me. So anyway, I had this terrible experience with GBS. I kind of lurked uh, on the side of the foundation at that time. You know, I kind of uh, spent a lot of time reading the newsletter, um, read what I could find on the web, visited the website a ton, but sort of, you know, lurked on the side, um, just sort of taking the information in and kind of trying to deal with it my own way. Um, and, you know, I was very, very thankful for the foundation's existence and the, the actual information that was out there. Um, it was certainly true in my case that, you know, my doctor didn't understand what was going on. The first neurologist I met didn't understand what was going on. And I was lucky through just, you know, the blessing of having personal connections to uh, be able to be connected to a teaching hospital where people really did know what was going on. And that kind of helped turn the road uh, for me. But, you know, the foundation was kind of there lurking on the side once, that, once I got that diagnosis. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful to the foundation for its existence. Um, but I kind of got through it. And uh, what, what was sort of stuck in the back of my head after the experience was, I need to do something good with this. <laughs> you know, this is a very bad experience, but I want to do something, I want to do something positive with it. I'd barely even told anybody I'd had GBS. You know, I just kind of did my best to work through it. Um, but I thought, you know, at some point in time, I need to kind of pop my head up and actually, you know, do something productive. So in around uh, 2014, I had this, uh, this idea that I'd, do a couple of things. First of all, I'd be honest that I had GBS and I'd get out there and tell anybody who would listen and, and explain what it was and try and raise awareness. And I also decided I'd raise some money uh, for the foundation because it seemed like a profound way to, to give, something, give something back and, you know, and help 
help you help others. Um, so, so that's what I went about doing. Um, so uh, if, if we go back to uh, New Year's Eve uh, uh, 2014, I'd had a few wines uh, like uh, most people do on New Year's Eve. And I turned to my wife and I said, I've got this idea. Uh, I'm going to run 52 races in 52 weeks, and I'm going to raise 52,000 bucks for, for the GBS CIDP Foundation. Uh, this is while I'm drinking wine. Um, <laughs> And she said, great, let's do it. You know, let's, uh, we were actually in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. She said, well, we should find a race uh, since you're going to run these races. And so we, uh, we woke up the next morning. It was too late. You know, I'd, I'd made the resolution. I was going to go do it. And I needed to find a race. So the first race we ran of the year was uh, on uh, January 3. It was a New Year's resolution run uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And we were, kind of, uh, we were kind of off to the races. To fast forward to the end of the story, before I tell you some of the stories about running along the way and, and raising money, uh, we ended up raising more than $52,000 for the foundation, which I'm really proud of. Um, I think we came up about a hundred and... Oh, thank you. Um, I think we came out, you know, about 114 bucks short of 60000 So, uh, So that was, that was really great. Um, we ran exactly 52 races. Well, I ran 52 races. My, my wife only ran 48. Um, so we ran a half marathon, uh, which was fun. That was the last race of the year. Um, we ran 11 uh, 10K races, uh, 34 5Ks, and uh, a bunch of other miscellaneous, uh, miscellaneous races. Um, by no means, you know, um, am I a runner? I mean, just look at me. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm like five foot eight and built like a tank, so I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, not a fast runner, but uh, I've always enjoyed running, and uh, I kind of wanted to punched GBS in the face by uh, getting out there and showing uh, the world that I could still run um, along the way of, you know, raising some, uh, some awareness and some, some funds for the foundation. Uh, we finished on December 27, so we had four days to spare, which was great, um, and, uh, you know, wrapped it up um, just whatever it is, nine or ten months ago. So I said I'd tell you a couple of stories of what happened along the way. Um, so 52 races is some crazy stuff that happened. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the harder races that I ran. Um, you know, if you've made this promise to do 52 races, you know, you're basically averaging a race a week. And so, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, where your professional life takes you, what's going on in your personal life, you've got to find a race to run. So uh, I had to go to Buenos Aires in Argentina um, for, a, for a work engagement. And so I don't, I don't speak Spanish. So I kind of uh, jumped on the web, uh, did some Google Translate, sort of figured out running races, uh, found this race in Buenos Aires. Um, the only problem was it was uh, six hours after I got off the plane. So I've you know, flown from California uh, to the bottom of Argentina, and then six hours later, I'm, I've got to go run this running race. Um, I didn't research the weather at all, um, but I got there and it was, it was warm, it was humid, um, horribly jet lagged, and I find myself uh, in a race with 25,000 people. Um, the photo will probably go past, you'll know which one it is when you see it. Uh, I found myself in this race with 25,000 people. It was a fundraiser for UNICEF. Um, running this uh, 10k race, uh, you know, in a country where I don't speak the language, jet lagged, it's hot, uh, and it's a 10k race. Um, so I remember that one being pretty tough, but uh, you know, made it through, got the t-shirt, uh, crossed off a crossed off another race. Uh, the half marathon that I ran at the end was brutally tough. Um, it had about 7,000 feet of climb in it um, on uh, on trails, so I can still remember that one well. My um, my quads are still a little sore from that, and it's nine months ago. All sorts, of, uh, all sorts of crazy things. Another story for you. Um, my, my humble recommendation to all of you is do not run any race that sounds like a novelty race. Um, don't do that. Like, just go run normal races. Um, I, I ran some crazy, crazy novelty races. Uh, I think I, uh, there we go, there I'm dressed as um, bacon with my wife is dressed as an egg. That's a perfect example of the kind of things that end up happening. Um, we ran a bubble run. Um, what these, these bubble runs are well advertised. What it, what it means, what you see on the website is that, you know, you're going to run through sort of a bubbles and soap and have fun with your kids and all these kinds of things. What actually happens is they send you to like a bomb site where, you know, it's basically been demolition because that's the only place they'll let people have bubbles. Um, some guys set up maybe four bubble stations over a 5k race and there's sort of little pathetic bubbles floating by and blowing by in the wind and you, you sort of run through this bomb site you get, a, you get the occasional bubble on you. Um, you're surrounded by small children who are running like at you and around you and in all kinds of, kinds of directions, and it's, uh, it's not the fun that's, uh, that's advertised. I'd say the same goes for uh, any run involving paint. Um, it's not as much fun as it sounds, um, so on and so forth. 
Um, I uh, ran a, a night race called the Firefly Race, and it was again advertised on the website as you know you're going to get all these neon glow, you know, sort of you know put headbands on the glow and all sorts of blinking lights and things. The only problem was it was run at four o'clock in the afternoon in California in the middle of summer. Um, <laughs> So I, I had the neon stuff, but I can't tell you whether it was working or not because uh, I was getting a sunburn at the time uh, during this uh, so-called firefly race. Uh, I ran a moonlight race, um, and that there wasn't any moon. Uh, well, maybe there was. I think it was advertised as a harvest moon race, so there probably was a moon somewhere, but all I remember was it was absolutely pitch black. And, uh, and it was quite a competitive race, so there's a bunch of people out there, there's a couple of thousand people all going as fast as they can in the complete dark down a down a dark trail. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, that was uh, a little scary. And then probably the, uh, well, there's maybe two absolute lowlights, uh, I'd say, in this, in this novelty experience. I thought uh, there was a race called the 5K9. So, you know, bit of a joke. You know, it's a 5K race. You bring your dog. Um, I discovered about a kilometer into this race that my, my dog hates running. <laughs> um, that and he also hates other dogs that are trying to run. <laughs> so that was, a, that, was a pretty, uh, that was a pretty long uh, afternoon. And then my, uh, my equal uh, low light experience was um, dressing up in a polyester Santa suit. You'll probably see that, uh, that one go by. Um, it was the cheapest Santa suit ever made. I'm sure it was probably cost about two bucks to make. Um, and uh, I ran in this polyester Santa suit in Sydney, Australia in about 100 degree weather um, with a whole bunch of uh, other people dressed as, uh, dressed as Santa. And I, I tell you, you know, running in a, with a polyester beard and a polyester cheap Santa suit is not, uh, not all it's cracked up to be. Made for some good photos, though. You'll probably see those, uh, see those go by. So anyway, number one lesson for you all is do not run novelty races. Just stick with, the, stick with the real ones. Last story I wanted to tell you is that I got horribly, horribly behind in this experience. Um, so, you know, made this promise. I'm going to run 52 races in a year. I found myself at the halfway mark about... 12, 13 races behind where I was supposed to be. Um, I'd had an injury, had an Achilles injury, and then I'd actually taken some time off to uh, uh, travel through South America with my family and I couldn't find any running races. Um, so, you know, the second half of the year was, uh, was pretty hard going. There was a couple of weekends where I'd race on a Friday night, race Saturday morning, race Sunday morning, sort of check off three races and then, uh, you know, massage the body, try and get it all back together and uh, repeat that next weekend. So. Um, so if you think 52 races sounds like a relatively modest uh, promise, um, you know, factor in things like injuries and travel and those kinds of things, and it turns out to be uh, a little bit more fun than it sounds. So there's some stories for you. I hope you enjoyed them. There's plenty of photos up on the, up on the screen. If, you're, uh, if you get bored listening to me at any point, there's some, uh, there's some nice shots up there of, uh, you know, running in some beautiful locations over the last year. So all up, you know, I'm... Uh, um, pretty proud of, uh, of what we did. You know, I think we, we achieved our goals, we ran the races, we raised the money. Um, but I thought maybe I'd share a little bit of, uh, you know, some of the things that sort of happened peripherally along the way and some things that I kind of learned through the experience. Um, well, I learned that, you know, one person can go raise awareness if they want to. Um, I, I was really lucky last week to actually just be approached by a, a student at uh, UC Berkeley who had just read about my story online. Turns out he's a computer science student, he'd had GBS. Um, you know, he needs help like a lot of people that, that, that you know. Um, and uh, he's going to come visit me at Google next week and take the guy out for lunch and show him around Google and, you know, listen to his story and hopefully help him. And that, you know, that for me is a, now a relatively common experience. I'm sure that's the case for you. But, um, uh, you know, just getting out there and telling your story and um, being honest about it and being honest about how you feel and offering help to others turns out to be a pretty powerful thing. Um, so maybe I'm more proud of of uh, the awareness and the, you know, the role that I can play now than, than I am actually of the, of the fundraiser itself. Um, I also learned you can turn a positive, uh, you can turn a negative into a positive. Like I feel, uh, you know, I feel really good to have uh, gone through that experience and then gone and done something uh, positive about it. Um, and I'd highly commend that to, to just about uh, anybody. Um, I'm a relatively uh, introverted guy. It might not be obvious. I mean, I do a lot of speaking, so it doesn't perhaps come across when I speak, but I'm a relatively introverted guy. I like hanging around with myself. Um, and uh, fundraising, you know, really flies against that. You've really got to put yourself out there if you want to fundraise. Um, you know, I was a little bit uh, cocky perhaps going into this thinking I can, I can, I can find some rich friends who will donate some money and we'll get to $52,000 reasonably e easily. It's, it's, it's very, very hard work, as I'm sure many of you, um, you know, deeply appreciate. Um, some particular things I learned, if, you're, if you ever think about uh, doing something similar, uh, Facebook works. 
um, you know, that is, a, that is a great medium for getting the message out there, particularly if you tag the people who've donated money to you. So you say, thank you to tag person for their generous contribution to my campaign, explain campaign. You know, that propagates through the world of Facebook and, um, you know, that's how you pick up uh, new people who might want to donate and it's certainly how you go about raising awareness. Um, I found that most of the other social uh, media ways of raising money don't work, um, but Facebook most certainly does, particularly if you're also trying to raise awareness. The last thing I learned in the fundraising experience was you've really just got to go and ask people. You know, you can't just put up your, 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 you know, your sad story and how you're hoping to raise money. Um, you've really got to get out there and actually ask people for money. Um, and that for me was pretty difficult. Um, email is a great way to do it. And I just discovered, you know, if I just, if I just write to people and say, hey, I've got this fundraiser and I'd, I'd really love a donation from you, um, then, uh, you know, the money starts to flow. And it probably took me sort of five or six months to get up that courage to actually reach out to the people that I wanted money from and, uh, and ask them. You know, through that, through just doing that, um, you know, I, uh, I got three $5,000 donations from three companies that I'd worked for just by going straight to the CEO and saying, you know, give me some money, uh, which was fantastic. And lots of donations from families and family and friends who probably intended to donate but really needed me to actually ask them to donate. And they were super cool when I asked, you know, they donated, thanked them back, and, uh, you know, it was a great experience. But most people, you know, just don't find the time to do it, even if they're planning to do it. So that was something that I, uh, you know, deeply, deeply learned along the way. So that's my story. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I just want to say a couple of thanks to people. Um, unfortunately, my wife's not here today, but um, I'd love to say thanks to her um, in front of you guys. Um, you know, she was a, an absolute trooper through this. As I said, she ran 48 races, but she was also the logistical brains behind this thing. Um, helped me find races, register for races, uh, take us there, get people to look after the kids, all the things that, you know, you need done so that you can get out and, uh, and, and have this kind of experience. Um, I also want to thank everybody who generously supported me. Um, there's probably some people here in this room who, who donated what they could along the way, um, and the foundation was, you know, incredibly supportive of what I was doing. So I want to, you know, thank anybody who donated. But again, just want to get the message out there that I'm, I'm very thankful to everybody who, uh, who participated. Um, there's over 100 people who, who donated in the end, you know, big and small, and um, in, in a funny kind of way, even the smallest donations mattered the most. I think, you know, if somebody somebody really just takes the time to go through all the effort to give you five dollars, you know, some, in, some, in some sense that means more than, you know, a corporation giving you five thousand. Um, so I was very, very touched by many of those donations. And then last of all, I want to thank the, you know, the foundation itself and thank all of you. Um, you know, the, the organization, um, you know, exists and I think, that's, I think that's, that's, that's incredibly amazing that there is a, there is a support group for all the people who've been through what most of us have been through. Um, I think, that's, I think that's wonderful. It was great to have the foundation so that I could, uh, you know, do the fundraising and, and uh, donate some money and hopefully get out there and help people. And, of course, the foundation, um, in particular Lisa, you know, supported me uh, right, through this, uh, right through this whole event. So with that, I'll, uh, I'm happy to take any questions should you have any, um, but I'll let you perhaps enjoy the, the rest of your lunch and thank you very, very much for uh, taking the time to listen to me. I don't know if somebody's got a mic, but there's a there's there's one question down there. Uh, maybe just yell, and I'll I'll repeat the question. How's that? Yeah, that's a great question. So just a question about, you know, so you had GBS and did that change how you prepare for races and how you think about races and all those kinds of things? Um, I'm a very lucky guy, actually. I've got to say, you know, um, so it's now seven years since I had GBS. You know, I was running six years after I had GBS. I'd say I have very little residual problems. Um, it certainly took me uh, somewhere between two and three years to run after I got GBS. And, you know, and I was a very keen runner before I got GBS. So there was sort of a, you know, there was a long recovery period there to kind of um, get back in shape. Um, lose all the weight I'd put on, all those kinds of things, um, and, you know, get back running. But, uh, but I was lucky enough that last year I was, I was pretty good. I think probably the big issue for me is I'm nearly 50, and, um, you know, running that many races uh, that often, um, especially some of the really challenging races, was tough. So certainly lots of stretching, 
you know, massaging, foam rolling, uh, all those kinds of things turned out to be pretty important. And I, I imagine, you know, those things are important even if you're, uh, whether you're, you know, whether you're fitting well or whether you've still got some residuals from, um, from, from GB, GBS or, or some of the related conditions. What's the next goal? Um, no pressure. Yeah, I need I need a couple of wines before I promise. I think. Um, <laughs> no. Well, this year I haven't done much running. I'll tell you that much. Um, so this year I've just been riding my bike to work and, and home again, which has been a lot of fun and you know turned the pressure down a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I would love I would love to uh, do a couple of things. You know, I, I would love to do some personal fundraising again in the future. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, I've learnt a lot and I want to go and apply it again. Um, so I'll think that through. Um, the second thing is I always say to, to Santo and to, to Lisa is I'm really happy to help out the foundation in any capacity that I can. So, um, you know, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll find a meaningful way there. But I'm, I'm certainly no medical practitioner and so I probably have only limited practical, uh, practical use. Did you get any of the list? Yes, I did. Um, I did. I'll. Uh, I'll, uh, one race I got 50 bucks in prize money, <laughs> and I think, I think it was because everybody entered the longer distance, so I think that's the reason. The, the other one I won, so I was coming seventh, and there was a whole bunch of like high school kids in front of me, and they're just pulling away from me, you know, sort of going off in the distance, and this race was one of these kind of run out and turn around and come back type races, um, and the turnaround wasn't really well marked. So, you know, usually they put down a bit of flour with an arrow or something and a, and a cone. They'd sort of, I think they just put the cone down, but not the turnaround arrow. So this, the, the, the six kids, these high school kids, just kept on steaming. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is the turnaround. So I just kind of nipped around the cone and hightailed it out of there. So suddenly I went from being seventh to first. And then, of course, but I'm, of course, I'm only halfway, right? And these kids figure it out pretty quick. So they turn around and they're like, heck, there's this guy who's winning and he's some old guy, I'm gonna, you know, mow him down. So I, I've never run so fast in my life and I just spent the whole time like, you know, <laughs> looking over my shoulder just trying, to, just trying to stay in front. But I did end up winning, but perhaps, perhaps not, by, uh, not by fair means. If they had Google Maps, they would If they had Google Maps, they would have been fine, exactly. <laughs> okay, it's unfair advantage, indeed. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you listening. Thank you.